So um, uh, there are two classifications for, uh, for osteomyelitis. The most common one is this one, which is whether you have osteomyelitis that is hematogenous or contiguous. And, the, and so it's, it's either, uh, and so there are two things about hematogenous, contiguous, acute or chronic. So that's, that's one classification. There's another classification that is rarely used, but I just want to make sure that you know about it. And that's called the Mater's uh, uh, Sterling classification but I'll show you later. So the contiguous versus hematoids are contiguous as most all osteomyelitis are divided between those two. We think contiguous uh, osteomyelitis, there are many things so like peripheral vascular disease, there's uh, are associated with um, prosthetic joints, there's uh, things that have to do with fractures, and then there's all the topics within this area about septic arthritis, about septic bursitis, not confusing those things, and even pyomyositis. We're going to limit um, I'm going to try to limit the discussion a little bit just about osteomyelitis, but I want to make sure that you know that there's a lot more with musculoskeletal infections than just osteomyelitis and, uh, and, and that. So we have to, so we're going to um, um, make sure that we cover that. So hematogenous osteomyelitis can be acute or chronic. Uh, in the acute setting, uh, we have it uh, in children and adults. And why do we talk about children? Because a lot of times, the presentation of chronic osteomyelitis in adults is a result of the acute osteomyelitis in children. So it is important that you know that hematogenous osteomyelitis uh, in children is usually the metaphysis or long bones. And actually, it's very interesting because of the circulation. Uh, a lot of times in children, you're going to see the long bones and the joint affected. So they have the long, I mean, um, it is the most impressive thing. For example, when I was doing my fellowship, we, we there were no such thing as pediatric ID. Um, we went to do to do uh, consults in the NICU. So I never forget the picture of a little baby that had lost the whole bone. Everything was gone because he had got him um, hematogenous osteomyelitis. That's one of those pictures of an X-ray in my mind that I have never forgotten. So because in the, in, in 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 children, you can have the bone go to the joint and, and just take septic arthritis and the whole bone. So children is the metaphysis of long bones. So suppose that you as a child have osteomyelitis and they treat it or not treat it very well or whatever, that can reactivate as chronic osteo as an adult in a long bone and that will explain it for you. But in neonates and, and infants, that's why I'm telling you that you can have it as the long bone, but in the joint itself, which as we know, in, in, in an adult, you're never going to have a septic arthritis uh, going into the bone. The exception sometimes in adults can be tuberculosis can do it. Right. So, but in that, but in children, you know, metastasis of long bones, neonates, uh, septic arthritis can be presented or the long bone. And in adults, you can have lumbar, thoracic, or cervical. Um, obviously, lumbar is the most common, thoracic is um, and, um, cervical about equal. And when you have upper, you know, like cervical, and th uh, you always wonder a lot about uh, IV drug use. What about symptoms? Um, the, the patients are going to have a lot of pain. So if you all have, have seen by now this cardiac and osteomyelitis of the vertebral spine, I mean, it is a lot of pain, and it's very difficult to move, and they have a lot of tenderness. Um, they, use, they may or may not have a fever, by the time they present, because the bacteremia may have been, you know, already a while back, or they may have been treated for bacteremia and then seeded, and then they come back with discitis. Uh, in terms of kids, um, again, they present a lot of times because they don't move the extremity. They have so much pain that they have like this pseudo paralysis. Um, so that is a very important presentation in children. In sickle cell, um, it's kind of hard to, you know, differentiate it between the osteomyelitis and the sickle cell crisis. Um, so, so who are at high risk for patients to develop hematogenous osteo? Obviously, sickle cell patients, hemodialysis patients, um, and you, know, you shouldn't, you should always, when you have a bacteremic uh, patient, especially with a staph aureus, you should always check the spine, make sure that there's no, um, there's no, um, there's no tenderness in that in the vertebral spine, and obviously, IV drug users, of course, uh, are going to be at high risk. In terms of what can cause it, staph aureus is going to be always the most common, and you all know that. Um, and 
But in children, you can have hemophilus influenza because, you know, that's a common thing in children. Uh, you can have gram negative, especially in, in the vertebral spine with a source like coming from the um, from the prostate or recurrent UTIs or patients that have other issues um, like that. Uh, anaerobes are going to be rare, but they can happen. Um, and then it's not to be forgotten that mycobacterium tuberculosis likes the spine. We have also, you can also see mycobacterium tuberculosis with the staph aureus. Matter of fact, during my fellowship, I, um, I, um, uh, I published a paper where we actually, at Tampa General, were able to pick up with our bone protocol several cases of tuberculosis with a staph aureus coexistent. So when you have a vertebral osteo, you always should check a quantiferon. And if you do a biopsy, you always want to look for, um, uh, for the pathology um, of Cachian and granulomas and uh, either PCR or, or whatever, so that you don't, you don't want to forget that uh, not only um, micro that tuberculosis is important in the spine, but it may coexist with bacterial infection. Um, the ones that I published, they were all staph aureus, but it's the most common one. My guess is that you can have it with any other bacteria. So always check for uh, tuberculosis when you have that. So um, what about the diagnosis? The blood cultures, obviously, if they're positive, they're very helpful. Um, and that gives you, um, you know, an easy answer. But they're not going to be positive all the time. And because you have negative blood cultures, that doesn't mean that you don't have a vertebral osteomyelitis. Um, the white count may not be abnormal. Um, usually the set ray and the CRP may be elevated. Um, and you can do all kinds of x-rays and bone scans and all of that. Uh, most of us just go ahead and go directly if we suspect uh, a vertebral um, um, osteomyelitis in an adult, we go to MRI. In children, uh, a lot of times, a bone scan or a plain film, you start with a plain film and then go on to uh, getting a bone scan and uh, if you need something else for the long bone um, uh, hematoyer and sosteo. At the end of the day, what we want to do is know what bacteria is causing it. So we want to do a needle aspiration and if need be an open biopsy. Um, we're going to talk about some of, some of the abscesses and things that like when do you need to do an open, you know, uh, an IND. So uh, when is it that in hematoyer and sosteo do you need surgery? Um, sometimes you need, it, you need it for diagnosis. Um, you have to realize that if you have a hematoyer and sosteo in a long bone in children and the hip joint is involved, if there's any concern with the hip joint, that requires immediate surgery uh, very quickly because that can really hurt the child uh, long term. Um, obviously, in adult neurological complications of the vertebral spine. So when you do an exam for osteomyelitis, this kind, you have to get in the history, make sure that you talk about you have pain, but do you have any neurological problem? Are you having incontinence? Are you having retention? both incontinence and retention. Are you having trouble with your bowels? Can you move your legs? You need to do a neurological exam. Let me remind you that we do not take care of x-rays and labs. We take care of patients. So you, are a, you went to medical school to take care of patients. So this is one time where you really need to examine the patient. It's one of the biggest litigations for infectious diseases. If you look at all litigation for infectious diseases, I cannot, people, cannot explain this to you anymore. Is you missed, you missed a neurological finding on a patient with discitis or or osteomyelitis of the spine. Please repeat this. You go as soon as you get that counsel, you examine that patient, you document a good neurological exam, you find anything neurological, you get that stat MRI, and you get and document that you talk to neurosurgery, and you get all those people in there. I mean, this is in private practice and in the world. I cannot tell you how many cases around the country happen because of this. Because people can become paraplegic, people can lose, and that is a big issue. And if, really, and if you think that because a patient is an IV drug user, it doesn't matter, you're wrong. And again, vertebral osteo, pain, any concern for vertebral osteo, good neurological exam, good history of anything neurological, are you having, can you pee with this retention or incontinence, bowels, movement, all of those things. And then you examine, you document it all very well. 
and then you get your start MRI. And, as, and you put in your consoles and you follow that patient very closely because that is a big deal. Number one, it's the right thing to do medically. And number two, it's a big, uh, it's a big litigation problem. So for children, always, when, you, when you're looking at a child with hematogenous osteo, make sure you check all their joints. Hips are really important. For um, adults, the spine is usually the issue. You document a good neurological history of all the findings and a good exam. Um, and a lot of times in children, you have uh, sequestration, means that it's a little piece of bone that's kind of dead and it has, it has to go to surgery. So um, that's why, you know, those are the cases that you're going to take to surgery because, you know, you may need a diagnosis. The hip has to be drained. In an adult, you have neurological findings. Um, in a child, you may have sequestration on a long bone from a chronic osteo that now shows up. Um, or if the patient is not responding to, um, to therapy. Um, obviously, this sometimes it becomes a little bit of an issue because neurosurgeons love to tell you, just treat them with antibiotics. That's why these patients need very close follow-up of their neurological exam because as soon as that changes, then it becomes, they do need to go to the OR. So the best opportunity for therapy of hematogenous and osteo is that of that initial therapy, um, and obviously IV antibiotics, high doses, six weeks, we know all of that. Um, you know, um, sometimes you see patients with, um, um, that, uh, that get immobilized when they have an infection, whatever the infection is, uh, whether it is with a, uh, um, with a back brace or in children with something for the, for the extremity, and those things do help with, um, with healing. You know, before we had antibiotics, you think about tuberculosis and some of the other things in the past, that's what they used to do to help uh, those patients. <coughs> now, before we go on to contiguous osteomyelitis, um, you have to realize that we can have acute and we have chronic hematogenous osteo. We have uh, the acute osteo in kids we talked about long bone, in adults, vertigo. And sometimes you will see an adult come in when that they may have had osteo when they were children and has, has been dormant and something happens to their immune system and all of a sudden um, it, it, it relapses and, it may, and, and probably that's going to relapse not in the vertebral bones but in a long bone, for example, case that I have seen. Um, a wonderful, incredibly nice Japanese lady that, had, that was a kidney transplant patient. They call me to see this patient. This patient has a fistula, a draining fistula out of a femur. I'm like, what? So I started talking to the patient, and she remembered that as a little girl, the World War II, um, you know, she, was, she had married um, uh, somebody in the military and, and was living in Tampa and had gotten a kidney transplant. She had had a fracture and, had, and she had had to take antibiotics. And, we, you know, that lady had had a hematogenous osteo or the femur that had been treated as a child was dormant for years and showed up with a draining sinus after a kidney transplant. Uh, and we saw her like a year and a half after a kidney transplant. So, you know, again, with the care of the patients, you have to, and you have to understand how these things happen because, you know, nobody, everybody's gaining x-rays. There's no metal in there. There's no, how is this lady has a chronic, nobody had talked to the patient and figured out that she had had osteo when she was uh, a child. In, um, in, uh, after World War II. So those things do happen. Um, so you have to think about that. So let's move on. Uh, any questions about hematogenous osteo before we move on to contiguous osteo? Okay, so um, actually contiguous osteo is a very difficult problem and it is very extensive. We're going to try to figure out how to go through it. Um, almost um, usually has a lot to do with surgery or puncture wounds or some kind of uh, of the cuvitus. Also, you have open fractures. So post-operative, you have a patient, you know, when you talk about prosthetic joint infection, that is continuous osteo because you have a metal there put in. You also have problems like somebody has a fracture, they go to the OR, um, you know, you fell and broke a hip or broke a leg, whatever, and you went and had a clean surgery, open reduction, internal fixation, whether it's a hip, a long bone, a, a wrist, whatever. Um, and then later they get infected as contiguous osteo. 
um, you have a, the cuberous also that gets to the to the bone, but it does contiguous osteo. Uh, you have a plancher wound. The typical one is the, the the construction worker in tennis shoes, and they get the needle, uh, the nail, uh, and they get through the uh, through the foot. But it can happen. I mean, little kids can get it from walking barefoot, or you can get it. In, uh, you may be walking without shoes somewhere, uh, and it can happen. Um, obviously, we also have the question about diabetic feet. We have the question about patients that have peripheral vascular disease. So this is a very extensive um, uh, topic. Um, and you also have open fractures that, by the fact that the bone, so the, world, the bone is a very, it's a piece of um, tissue that has no blood supply, right? So if you have an open fracture and that <coughs> bone decides to see the world and gets a little dirt because, you know, you had a motorcycle accident, what do you think is going to happen? So, so we have, so contiguous osteo is a huge, huge uh, uh, topic. We've already mentioned that we always think about also being acute versus chronic. We talked about how uh, hematogenous osteo, usually we get to see it in the acute phase, and that's our best chance to, uh, to treat it and get rid of it, but occasionally you see a chronic presentation. But in contiguous osteo, we see a lot more of the chronic phase. Hopefully we can see it in the acute, and that's our best chance always to, to treat it, but a lot of times you see it uh, chronically. And the chronic changes, you have indolent forces, you have sinus tract, you have soft tissue swelling. And this is the tip, this is the patient that uh, has had old trauma or have had an old prosthetic joint and nobody has paid attention to them. And actually a lot of times we sense with, you know, getting better and they, they was given antibiotics and it got better and then got worse and, and the story goes on. In the outpatient world, sometimes I see a patient that has had a prosthetic joint infection for two years and no diagnosis has been made. And I know that they may sound to you strange, but it happens all the time. Uh, and they present with a draining sinus and, 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 and some doctor out there have told them that, that they had a little abscess and they have drained a fistula tract. These things happen. I know that, you know, I look at your faces and it's like, I'm talking Chinese. I'm not, this happens all the time. We see the patients in the office. They come in and they have had a prosthetic joint in sun elsewhere, and they have, somebody has been opening and draining little things. And when you start talking to the patient, you realize that he has, a, that he has had a, a, a chronic prosthetic joint infection for a couple of years with draining sinuses. So they can have a very indolent course before they present um, because they haven't seen the correct person. Uh, you know, they have been seeing whoever that doesn't understand what, not with bad intentions, they just don't know what's going on. And, but if you ever see a sinus tract, as everybody know, a sinus tract looks like. Do you, you know what sinus tract is? Do you know exactly how a sinus tract looks? Uh, yeah, I've seen a few. Okay, have, has anybody, has any, there's somebody that doesn't know what a sinus tract is. You guys know what a sinus tract is? So a sinus tract is, if you look at somebody's skin and it looks like um, you have a, an indurated, I should have added a picture, um, I will add that to my next lecture. It's a, it's a, it has you have the, the, the skin and it has a soft area. It looks almost like an abscess. It kind of has a little bit of a different color. And when you talk it, it's, touch it, it's really soft. And sometimes you're draining. But it may not be draining at the time you see them. It may just be, it literally looks like, like the skin is softer. It's purplish looking. Um, and it drains now and then. But the day you see it, it may not be draining. So when you see a sinus tract, the next question is, is there some bone under there that it may be an issue? And sometimes it can be over some kind of a scar. If you see something like that on, on a scar, on an old scar, like of a hip or a leg or something, that is very characteristic. So, so every time you have a sinus tract, you want to make sure that there's no chronic osteomyelitis under there. And a lot of times they have, and a lot of times you have, it's kind of hard to tell because now they have, they present with this, especially in the lower extremities, they present with a cellulitis, the leg is swollen, it's red. And then you see that little area that has a sinus tract where you have the, the, the wound is, the, the, there's the, um, the surgery, and then you have the area that is localized and, you, and that's where it's uh, draining. The problem with chronic osteo is that blood cultures are not going to help you. The white count may be a little high, but usually it's not. Uh, even the CRP and the CRP may not be that high because these people have had this problem for a long time. 
they have been in suppressive antibiotics. And um, so, um, and uh, x-rays may help you uh, because you may see a non-union or a mild union and, uh, and um, the, uh, the um, bone scans may help you. Uh, a lot of times, honestly, looking at and having the, looking at the patient and going in, it helps a lot more than anything, but the x-rays and bonus scans do help um, in, in, in this case. Eventually, that patient needs to be debrided and cultured. And in the therapy of chronic osteo, you have to also, you have to realize that they, especially when you have had either, it depends on the chronic osteo that you have. If you have a prosthetic joint infection, which we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about all of these things, Usually you have one bacteria. If you have a open reduction and internal fixation of a closed fracture, you usually have one bacteria. You have an open fracture, it's usually mixed. Uh, so uh, so it, and uh, the cubitus, things like that, it's of, of, of things going to be mixed uh, in anterior sclerotic peripheral vascular disease, in diabetes, all of those are going to be mixed. So it depends. So you have to understand what happened to the patient. So you have to get a good history so that you can start uh, trying to figure it out. But at the end of the day, um, we want to make sure that we culture the bone um, and try to figure it out. There are some times, uh, and we're going to talk about it with diabetic feet, that we don't want to overdo things, but in the other ones, we do. So the therapy of chronic osteo and some of these contiguous osteomyelitis may be difficult. You have relapse, and it's always a, a work with the osteo with the orthopedic and an infectious disease doctor. And there's a lot of things that we have to talk about. We have to, we have to understand bed space. We have to understand what flaps do. We have to understand hardware. And we have to understand stability. What do you think is more important? Stability, suppose that you have a fracture. What do you think is more important, infection or stability? What would you choose? Uh, infection or stability? What do you think? It's a, uh, I broke my leg. I love to ride a motorcycle. I've never been a motorcycle in my life, but I, I, be, I mean, in my 60s, I became crazy and decided to get a motorcycle. And I broke my leg. I have an open fracture. It's more important, a stability or taking care of the infection? What do you think? Stability. stability. So one of the worst things that you have to understand orthopedics to help your, to help your colleagues, because if I hear this, you want to see an orthopedic not trust you and not care what you say is when you ask an orthopedic, take this out when you can because everything is going to fall apart. Suppose that you have a Harrington rod. In, suppose that you have, that somebody did scoliosis surgery for it for, for a 19-year-old and they put some Harrington rods in the back and it got infected and you tell them that they need to take out the Harrington rods. And not, it's not going to happen, guys. I have had people send me patients from Gainesville because of this. So what you do is you leave the Harrington rods, you decrease the infection, you get it there, stop the infection, then you put them on pills. And a lot of times, if you wait long enough, that is spine is good enough that they're able to, in two or three years, take out those Harrington rods, and then you treat again, and then you may be able to stop antibiotics later. But you have to work with orthopedics and you have to talk. In osteomyelitis, Ortho, orthopedic surgeons always know what ID they work with and they talk and they plan together. If you don't do that, you're not going to move forward on the with these patients. I am, I'm in the speed dial of probably all the orthopedics from FOI. They call all the time because you have to you have to know how you're going to deal with these patients. And it's usually not a three or four day thing, it's months and months and months. Most of these cases take eight months, a year, two years to get them to a completion where they have things are quiet down enough that you can move forward. So it is difficult. It takes time. It takes surgery. It takes communication. And we're going to talk a little bit about data space and flaps and all these things. But you have to understand when to keep the hardware, when to move it, what, what, what is stability, what can and cannot be done so you can help the patients. We're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about diabetics and vascularis and arteriosclerosis peripheral vascular disease, which is a totally different subject than how you treat trauma. So you cannot, not all osteomyelitis is the same. We talked about hematoma doing one way. Now we're going to talk about how you deal with prosthetic joints is one way. Even though they're all contiguous, you deal with prosthetic joints one way. You deal with trauma, whether it's an open 
fracture or a close fracture one way. And all of these people, diabetic, uh, at the exploratory vessel, those that's different. Uh, and then there's still the decubitus that are different. They're all different cases. So to lump all osteomyelitis into one disease is a major mistake. Each one is a little different. Um, when you talk about atherosclerotic peripheral vascular disease and diabetics, every time you have you examine a foot, you want to know two things. What is the blood supply and what is the um, neurological status of that foot? Do not ever. There's when you look at musculoskeletal things, if you have anything in the hands, what is the next thing you need to know? Nine hand, right handed, left handed. And what do they do for a living? Very different. If I have a problem in my right hand, I'm an ID doctor. I really don't need my hands. Versus <laughs> I'm an ophthalmologist or a pianist, right? I'm a concert pianist, for God's sake. So right handed, left handed, what do you do for a living? For the hands, okay? Um, and in diabetics and legs and things like that, you also want to know blood supply. Can you, can I feel the pulses? Is there a lymphedema or not? And what is the neurological status? And uh, you start by proprioception, and then whether they have the sensory or not. So you have to understand. You have you cannot have in your exam without those things or in your history. So we wanted so the the, if the patient has tissue ischemia. Or neuropathy, you're going to have, you're going to deal with those things differently. And also, the x rays are going to be very affected. I'm going to talk to you a little bit later about how, how an MRI of a, an MRI or a bone scan of a patient with a sharp joint looks like. It's a Christmas tree. And you're not going to make any decision based on a Christmas tree looking MRI or bone scan of a patient that has diabetic sharp joint because they really look, they, they really look like a Christmas tree. And if you don't know about, if I have another patient being sent to my office, by some nurse practitioner of primary care that got an MRI on a sharp joint and it's a Christmas tree, but the patient's food is totally normal. What that patient doesn't need antibiotics. He needs a boot immobilization so the sharp joint fuses. Doesn't need antibiotics. And that happens all the time. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Too. So, um, in, in most of these contiguous socio systemic findings are very rare, local changes. Can happen with cellulitis and swelling in the extremity, but 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 mainly you have to look at what's happening in the area. Again, for osteos of, I'm going to talk about prosthetic joints in a little bit alone, but uh, for, and and also about fractures. But now, if you look at the uh, at, at the um, approach of patients with peripheral vascular disease and diabetes. Uh, they usually don't have many systemic signs. Sometimes they do. They have a bad cellulitis involved with the area. But um, but you want to, you know, the blood pressures are not going to be very helpful. The separate and the CRP may help. Plain films are probably more useful than bone scans because in a lot of the patients that have peripheral vascular disease or they have neuropathy, the bone scans are very uh, are very difficult to interpret. Think about it. If you have a fracture, if you have any pressure, and all those patients have have pressure issues. So it's not going to be very helpful. Uh, you have to be careful with bone asking for bone cultures. Sometimes depends on the patient. If the patient has very bad circulation, um, that may be a problem because your goal is to save the foot, not to amputate, uh, not to cause a problem. You don't want to make things worse. Um, that's why before we make any decisions, you always want to know what the vascular supply is, what the arterial dopplers or whatever the vascular supply and, and the neurological status. So if you have a diabetic foot and ischemic foot, the first is the arterial supply is poor, can it be fixed? That's more important than dealing with the osteomyelitis. So can we fix the arterial supply? You cannot change the neurological status, but you can change a lot of times the blood supply because you can get antibiotics to the area. Once that's fixed, then you can debride, then you can treat. Uh, if there's no way to to um, to uh, to do anything with the arterial supply, a lot of times, you don't ask for a bone culture. You just want to feed empirically and keep the foot and see how the patient does because you, you can make things worse. So you have to have a lot of common sense and, again, communication with who you're working with. So if you have um, a diabetic foot, a peripheral vascular disease, somebody that doesn't have blood circulation, 
we want to make sure that we understand the circulation and the neurological status. The circulation is, is poor, you want to fix that. Um, and that's great. And then you can deal with it. But if you cannot, uh, then you want to be conservative um, because you don't want to make things worse. Because if you have somebody that doesn't have blood supply and you do a biopsy or you debride, you're going, all you're going to do is get a bigger wound, right? So you want to be conservative on those cases. So that's why, again, communication, what's happening is really very important. I'm going to, we're going to, we're going to start talking now. Um, we talked about hematogenous osteo. We talked about uh, diabetic feed as one of the um, uh, contiguous osteo. But like I said before, the, in contiguous osteo, we have, um, we have multiple things um, that, and a lot of the contiguous osteo has to do with trauma. So um, hematogenous osteo is one thing that, we, that, that is fairly defined in kids and adults. But in contiguous osteo, we have, uh, we just talked a little bit about diabetic feed and peripheral vascular disease. Now we're going to talk about trauma. But as part of trauma, you have to know that there's this other classification that is not on, that a lot of the trauma physicians like. It's called the Terminator uh, classification. Uh, and this is contiguous osteo, but associated with trauma. And this one, uh, uh, um, Cerny was an orthopedic major, was an IV doctor, and they got together, and what they did is they did the staging system. In, in Tampa, we don't use it very much, and, and there's some places around the country that use it, but I think that you need to at least know that it exists, because, it's, because some of the trauma surgeons really do, do like it, and you may have a phone call from somebody, so at least you need to know that this exists. So the anatomic types and the physiological types, and they classify everything and how they're going to treat it based on this. So um, the anatomic classifications is where, again, this is for trauma. So um, is where where is the, um, the the problem? Where there's medullary, superficial, localized, or diffuse, uh, and they and they give it different stages. So that is how they do it. And then the physiological class, they have it whether you have a normal host whether you have a host that is uh, systemically compromised, locally compromised, or both. Um, and, and that is how or the host or the treatment may be worse than the disease. Uh, so the systemic uh, ones are things like bad nutrition, problems with your kidneys, diabetes, you know, the typical um, issue, problems with the immune system, extreme age, immune deficiency. So the, and then local issues are things like lymphedema, venous stasis, um, you know, uh, basal compromise, many other things that have to do with the local. Or you, like I said, it may be both. Again, this is mainly for trauma, and this is so that you know how, in case there's somebody talks to you about. Before we will start talking about trauma, I want to make sure that everybody knows the difference between bursitis and septic joint. How do you differentiate a septic joint versus bursitis? Actually, from rounding, know that this can be a little confusing. A septic joint, you cannot move the arm, and the septic joint comes from the blood, the joint, right? A septic bursitis is from outside in, like that. That's a septic joint. You see, it looks the whole thing looks, I mean, it's tender, and that person can move the arm. You can see how it goes from outside in. Um, and the most um, obviously you can have it in the knees and in the elbows, and septic bursitis. But that's not to be confused ever with a septic arthritis. But the septic arthritis is hematogenous process versus this, which is not. This is a localized process. I was going to talk about uh, making sure that everybody knew about it, but I'm going to skip this because we need to move on. Okay, so I want to make sure that uh, as, as we start talking about therapies and dead space and all those stuff, a um, couple of comments about therapy. We're going to do the therapy based on the cultures, but um, the point about adding refumping um, for staff, also being careful about fluoroquinolone in the acute, after acute uh, fractures because of the problem with bone healing. Um, and actually, Pointing out that actually septra does have a very good bone penetration, which a lot of people don't understand that that is a good drug 
in osteomyelitis. Uh, but we're going to um, talk a little bit now about the uh, beads are these. Have you ever seen it, the beads? The beads that they put inside bone. Uh, we're going to have it uh, the, when when you're talking about um, so now we're going to go into the trauma thing now that we look at that new classification. When you have trauma, uh, usually you have either a closed fracture or an open fracture, right? In a closed fracture, you have somebody, usually a, a closed fracture, um, you wait until this, you either do it right away or you have, or they wait until the swelling is down and they, they, they put some metal to, to um, if they have to do surgery. Sometimes, some closed fractures don't need to have surgery. They can just be, um, they, they can be adjusted and casted and that's the end of it. That's wonderful. But if they have to have surgery, usually you do an, what is called um, a, a internal fixation by whether it's by a rod, by screws, by plates, by whatever. And then open fractures are totally different. But either one of them, when they get infected and they are, and, if, and things are taken out and you may have to put an outside fixator or something else, there may be pieces inside the tissue that is that is um, that doesn't have anything, like the piece of bone that got cleaned up, because you have to clean everything that is infected when you're trying to debride it. And that's what we call a dead space. And you never leave a dead space in musculoskeletal areas. You either have to put a flap or you have to put something to uh, in there to keep that dead space from filling up with fluid. So beads are used a lot for dead space um, uh, because not only if you have an infection, the beads have antibiotics and they can elude, and that's the correct term, elution of, uh, of antibiotics into that dead space. So you have, you have uh, some, so because in the future, you're going to put probably a bone graft which comes from somewhere else, but you can never put a bone graft on infect in, in the middle of an infection. That's not okay. You always have to clean the infection first. So the orthopedic surgeon, whether you have a closed fracture or 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 a uh, uh, or an open fracture that is infected, the first thing that they're going to do is clean it all and try to stabilize it whatever way they want they can. An outside fixator, or they may have to leave the the, uh, the fixation inside. But, make, but they never want to leave dead space. So you can, the dead space is treated either with a muscle flap or with beads. And muscle flaps can be rotational or free flaps. Rotational flap is where the blood supply is in the same area. A um, free flap is where the, it comes from a different place of the body. So you, that's, so flaps and beads is how you deal with dead space. Um, Go over dead space again. It's like I know it's in the okay. So 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 I I I was in the motorcycle accident, uh -huh. and my uh, and my tibia really in the middle of my tibia, my fibula. You know, I got like piece there that is empty. That there's a piece of bone. There's a piece of bone in the bottom, oh, okay. and now uh, the only way that they can stabilize me is they put an outside. They put they put an external fixator with little pins okay. so that things establish. But I have a hole in there. Okay. So that hole. Uh, it, uh, it was all necrotic, and and the first time that they did surgery, they tried to fix it for me, but it didn't work. They had to take out all the all the fixation okay. out, and now they have an outside fixator, and the, and I have this hole in the middle, okay. and they cannot put a bone graft yet because it's infected. So you have to do two things. So usually in that case, it's going to be beads. Okay. Um, if it's in a different area, uh, sometimes they put a, a, a flap. But you all never leave a, a, a dead space like that open, um, and because because you what you because the number one thing that they do once you have an infected joint, an infected I'm sorry, an infected uh, a fracture, whether it's an open or a closed fracture, uh, you clean you have to clean everything that is infected, um, and a lot and then you have to figure out how to stabilize it, and you have to deal with dead space. So that, those are the three principles. Uh, once you haven't infected anything in, in an extremity, you clean everything infected, you deal with dead space, and you stabilize. Then later you decide how you're going to deal with, uh, with whether you need a bone graft, whether you need an elisorol, for example, so that you can move the bone so that it can heal, all of those things. Um, 
but you do have to understand a little bit of the orth. If you're going to do orth you, and you know, if you go to a community hospital, you're probably not going to see any of these things. But if you're a Tampa General, uh, you're going to see on AC and all these places, you're going to see a lot of this stuff. And and you can see how these things are not going to happen in three days. I mean, these are nine and ten months of having to deal with this because you have to, you know, the patient comes in, gets cleaned up, now you deal with the dead space, send on IV antibiotics, then later it's going to have to come back for a bone graft and all of that. It goes on forever. But to deal one of the best ways in, and that we as infectious disease physicians like uh, is either, we like, obviously flaps are nice because a flap brings blood supply to the area, but the beads, you have them, and, and, and actually here, sometimes they do them in the OR themselves. What they do is they get this little, I think I have a picture coming up, and then you can put gentamicin, you can put Tobra, you can put all kinds of things, and then you're putting all of these antibiotics right there. Uh, most of them, most, and then the beads eventually, they can be changed or, the beads, or they'll have to be taken out. And, and, the, and the word used is for elution. You can also use vancos, cephalosporins, and that elution is what is called for the, uh, and, and actually there are charts of telling you how long that elution lasts uh, for, uh, for this antibiotic. The antibiotic. Oh, here's the picture. You see the dead space here, you see those, little, they look like little marbles. Mm -hmm. Those are beads. And they literally, they put them in there to save that space. And they have antibiotics and they concentrate that antibiotic in that infected tissue. You have to take out the beads or you're just going to dissolve them? No, no, you take them out. Usually they keep them in for uh, X amount of time um, and they, and I know they have to come out. And then in there, you're gonna either, usually the, 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 be, the beads are gonna be taken out and you're gonna probably put a bone graft in there. This is because it was a hole. Are so it's like systemically absorbed, like the, like the antibiotics? The antibiotics are losing the, in the area and they're going, but, but your blood levels are very low. You, and actually, you do both. You do you give the IVs, and then you leave, you leave, you put them beads with the antibiotics. It's almost like you know how you put those spacers, yeah, which we're going to talk about later. So you can have fractures that are closed and open. Uh, the closed fracture, usually you have the open reduction internal fixation. This is like the uh, the person that broke the hip, or you had a simple fracture of um, like you know, like Dr. Torres that had the surgery in the uh, on the on the you know on the forearm, and most of them they fine, they heal, there's no problem, right? And those patients get perioperative antibiotics only. You I mean they get ANSEF or if they're MRSA positive, they get Banco and something else, whatever. And Banco and ANSEF, that's it. They're done. Most of them are fine. And open reduction, a close fracture, an open reduction fixation you have a very low infection rate. The problem is that you're not going to see all of those that went home and had no problem. You know which ones you're going to see? The ones that get infected. So those present with what is called a non-union. And what is a non-union? So body fracture and, and the things are not healing, right? So it's either a non-union or a mal-union. It's kind of like crooked. And that may be a mechanical issue. They, the orthopedic put the wrong thing or not stabilizing in the right places. But in a non-union or mal-union, as an infectious disease doctor, you're always going to rule out infection and usually it's a single organism so um, the patient you know had the fracture most of them did fine they're done but that one that developed a mild union and non-union when it goes to the orthopedic and now they're going to have to go back to the or now they're going to take everything out they're going to they're going to clean it up and that they're going to call you and usually that's when you want to make sure that you follow and then you're going to treat everything now why don't you be off antibiotic before this is done so that you can get good coaching? Two weeks. Two weeks is the minimum. If you look at the literature, a lot of people want a month, but in, but in our program, and it's really hard to get the, the, the orthopedics to do less than two weeks, but we got them trained at two weeks minimum right, around here. <laughs> so at least we got them trained for that part. So, so we have them trained two weeks, ideally longer. But so, so now you're going to go ahead and treat those patients. Now that's, that is, that is the, I mean, that's the easy one, right? The close fracture, they get infected, they're infected, you take care it's one organism, usually Staphylococcus, Staphylococcus, whatever. Um, and those are, now open fractures are very difficult to deal with. This is a big nightmare, and this is, means requires a lot of work between ortho and IV. And those are high energy trauma. Uh, they're usually associated with many other injuries, intra-abdominals, all, all kinds of things. So, you know, 
when you have a when you have a liver laceration or a trauma to your chest, all the, I promise you the leg is the last thing they're going to think about. They're going to leave it for the end. So uh, probably right. So we're going to be thinking more about some of these life threatening uh, injuries. So the leg just kind of gets stabilized and they'll worry about it later. So one of the things that we always do you know, these open fractures is the neurovascular status. And you have to realize that a lot of them are unfortunately complicated by compartment syndromes. So it becomes a mess. But by the time they're paying attention to the leg, it's a mess. So, and that's when they call us. So uh, the risk of infection uh, is very much related to the injury. I mean, the worse the injury in the leg or the arm or the whatever, the most likely it is that they are, they're correlated with a severity of infection. So if you have a type one open fracture, not that much, but if you have a type three open fracture, now you're talking 10 to 50% uh, chances that it was going to get infected. So we, and then there's the in-betweens. So open fractures have a high chance of getting infected, unless it's a very simple open fracture. Um, so the, the type of things that we do for prevention is that immediate antibiotic administration and wound debridement and obviously a tetanus shot. That's what we, that's what should be done, is the patient comes in with a, with a bad open fracture, antibiotics, debridement, and tetanus shot, right? But if there are life, other life threatening injuries, sometimes there's a little delay. And once you start delaying cleaning the leg, guess what's the chances of infections? Ooh, it starts going up. But you can't, I mean, you know, the, um, usually uh, other life threatening injuries come first. By the time that they are paying attention, they chances of infection in this open fracture is going to be really high. And these are always mixed and always cover for gram positive, gram negative, and anaerobes. And clostridium is always covered. And always good. They always good and they and they, you, you'll see the surgeons always. You usually get cold later, but the patient will be on this combination. They love that combination. Sometimes now they're on other combinations because they may have other injuries somewhere else, and that's fine. But you, are going, you should cover gram positive, gram negative, and anaerobes including clostridium. So you always want something that covers clostridium in open fractures of high energy, very complicated. Um, again, you're going to have the beads for um, for the, those dead spaces things, because you can imagine that in this one, when they go in there, it's a mess. So they're going to put beads and they're going to be changing those beads with whatever they have. So that's what we needed to talk about beads. Uh, the wound management of this is that you're going to debris them, um, and they uh, and this uh, you may have seen how they go to the OR over and over again. I'm sure what you're seeing when you're because they they have to go back and go back and go back until everything is clean. They're not going to worry at the beginning about what is left in there. They'll fix later. First is clean up. In these open fractures, is what is bad, what is dead, what is dirty clean it up. Then they'll worry about fixing later. So that is the way it's done. Um, so you're going to debris frequently. You're going to irrigate. Sometimes they irrigate with desecration, with polymycin, with whatever. And you, you, you do the wound closure. Um, and then you're going to, once they think that everything is clean, if there's dead space, they may put the beads until they can come back with a bone graft, or they're going to move flaps, whether they're a local flap, meaning just moving a piece of muscle without Without, without disturbing the artery or a free flap that comes from somewhere else. And you have seen those, and you have seen those legs of people that have this, you know, those big flaps. Um, and what the flap does is bring air, it, it helps with the dead space and it helps with the blood supply. So dead space is beads, flaps, and the bone grafting would be the ultimate solution, but that comes when the infection is taken care of. You never would do a bone flap. And actually, you may get a call from the surgeon, from the orthopedic surgeon. Hey, do you think that I can I can bone graft this? And you're going to have to tell them. They're going to ask you that all the time. A lot of times they'll bring the patient. The patient had had an issue, has beads or has whatever, and the patient goes home on IV antibiotics, and then the patient comes back for bone graft. And actually, you'll see them that they and you'll see it if you're in AC where they take the patient to the OR, they take out the beads, they do cultures, and if the cultures are negative then they'll do the bone graft. If the cultures are positive, they'll put bits back in, 
you give IV antibiotics and home you go again, and then they'll bring the patient back. But they'll but you have to understand that what they're talking about, because if you don't understand what you're talking about, how are you gonna help them, right? Are you gonna tell them yes or no? So you'll see the patient come in, oh, he needs the bone graft. They'll take him to the OR first, take out whatever, they, they do culture, they may not have beads in there, they may have the, the dead space maybe with a flap. They'll they lift the flap, they get the cultures, and make sure that everything is clean. And 48 hours later, if it's clean, they go in for the bone graft. But and they call you, they ask you, hey, can I put a bone graft? I mean, they'll ask you this. This will be a, call, a phone call from the orthopedic. Then they put the bone graft in and they, they move on. Um, now, um, so fracture fixation, so that, so that just to, you know, the, the nomenclature you can have intramedullary nailing, that is a lot done, like in the long bone, in some of the long bones, external fixation, um, uh, which is, you know, outside uh, and place and exclude. Um, so uh, it definitely depends on the fracture, the location, and how much soft injury uh, you have. So bone grafting, and the reason why I'm talking about bone grafting, because this is the call that you're going to get. Can I get a bone graft? Can I do my bone graft? Because that's the beginning of trying to get the patient finished, right? And this is going to always happen six weeks after the soft tissue transfer uh, to ensure that there's absence of infection. So a lot of times they have, they, you know, the patient came in with a bad open fracture, has gone to the wire multiple times. Now they think it's pretty clean. They're going to put some beads and, and flap it, or they're just going to flap it as control of the data space. You're going to treat them with IV antibiotics for six weeks, and then now, are they ready for bone graft? And then the patient's going to come in, have another look, and then whether the patient can bone graft. Okay. Um, uh, whenever, um, so the antibiotic administration for open fractures is a little different than closed fractures. Remember that we did the closed fracture is only perioperatively and you're done, right? But in, uh, in open fractures, uh, ideally, you have the patient early on. It's in three hours of the open fracture, you get antibiotics. The patient gets cleaned up right away, but sometimes you can't. But, but, but you do three to five days of antibiotics. Um, and if there's different, you know, subsequent procedures, they also get, uh, so they get antibiotics again, even if there's no infection, because they, there's an assumption. Obviously, if there's positive culture, you treat as usual. We're talking about patients that are not having. Okay. Any, before we go to a prosthetic joint, any, <laughs> Anything about uh, yeah about about uh, o, about ortho trauma things? So before you get the bone graft and you're treating with IV, you're treating for six weeks, right? Yeah, uh, you, you know the usual thing happens is that you have an open fracture, yeah. the patient have everything else that needs to be done. Uh, it's going to go to the, the open fracture. It's going to be the patient going to go to the OR. They're going to clean, mm -hmm. and 48 hours later they're going to clean again. And 48 hours later, they're going to clean again. They usually go two or three times to the OR. They decide what to do with that, with that. A flap, that's it. Um, beads and flap, uh, none of the above. They just send them home with a bag, whatever. So the patient goes home on IV antibiotics. The patient comes back. For like six weeks? Yeah. Yeah, okay, okay. Right. And then and they, come, they back. come back for the bone graft okay. because it was an acute, it's considered an acute contiguous osteo at that point, okay. um, and then they come back. Um, also, you may have somebody that may have had a, a open fracture a while back, and nobody has paid attention. He has now um, sinuses, you know, chronic sinuses. Now that patient comes in, and they have to take away everything because everything is a disaster in there, and, and then you start from the beginning, you know. So suppose that so you, so you had an open fracture uh, two years ago, and you have draining sinuses, and now you actually see an orthopedic that understands osteomyelitis. They all come in, they'll take everything out, and they they start treating him like from the beginning. Those are harder to cure, by the way. Because the ones, if you have a good trauma center that knows how to deal with the open fracture from the beginning, your um, your outcome is going to be better. But even in the best trauma center, thirty percent of open fractures get infected. So when you come back and they check, they take them to have a second. Well, they come back for the bone graft and, you, you know, they look for culture or they take cultures and make sure they're negative. You should be off of antibiotics at that point for two weeks, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Yeah, right. Yeah, you, you treated them for six weeks. They're off antibiotics. They come in, they do two weeks of um, 
um, and then then they do cultures. And if they're negative, they'll put the bone graft. If not, then the patients went back out with IV antibiotics again, and the whole thing starts again. And it's very frustrating for patients. This, yeah. this sometimes can be eight months, a year of going in and out. Patients are very frustrated, and you have to pay attention to the psychology of this because I mean, these people are usually younger. They're having a problem with their work. I mean, these are human beings whose lives have been changed dramatically with all of this, and it's very difficult. And it's and they get very, very. I mean, and they have a reason to. I mean, you, you need to understand that that's normal. I mean, think about if that happens to your family member. I mean, these people are in and out of hospitals, multiple surgeries. The patient will tell you, oh, this is my 15th surgery. I mean, they'll tell you this. I have had 15 surgeries on my leg, you know? So anyway. All right, so we're gonna move on to another kind of contiguous osteo. So we talked about hematogenous, kids and adults. We talked about peripheral vascular um, uh, and diabetes and all of that. And that, you know, we wanna make sure that uh, we always know uh, vascular supply and the neurological status. Um, and you want to, you know, uh, and then now we're going to talk about prosthetic joints, which is considered a contiguous osteo, but it's a very specific and different way of dealing with it. Um, the first thing you want to know about prosthetic joints is that actually we do a lot of joints. I mean, you can do shoulders, elbows, hips, knees, um, ankles, all, I mean, all kinds of joints are done a little everywhere. Um, what is the joint that is associated with the highest infection rate? Anybody know? Huh? Elbows. Elbows. Elbows are the worst. Elbows are the most difficult. It's the one that has the highest infection rate. Um, so elbows, um, so, um, so you never want a patient to have an elbow prosthetic joint by somebody that doesn't know how to do it. We do have a surgeon here that is pretty good. Um, so, but a, a joint comes, patient comes in for a joint, um, hopefully is a person that is a virgin joint, has not ever had anything on that joint. And that's perfect, that's, you want, those patients you have a very low infection rate and any infection control department always knows the infection rate for virgin joints of every surgeon does. And if you have a high infection rate, we do not want that surgeon. And other story. Prosthetic joint infections on, on virgin joints should be a very low infection rate. I mean, nothing is 100%, but it should be a very low infection rate. And every hospital, every hospital knows per surgeon infection rate for virgin joints, knees and hips. And I can tell you, I personally review every infection rate that happens at this hospital because the infection control nurses led to me immediately of why it happened, what was it that, what, what went wrong in that case. Um, so. What are some of the main things that, that I guess, surgeon related, you know, that might contribute to their numbers being high? Um, when you look at it from the infection control perspective, this is what you do. You have the hospital rate and the, and the, and the surgeon rate. If um, if the hospital rate um, is high and, if, and all the surgeons are high, it's a hospital problem. If the hospital rate is X, but this, this surgeon has a high rate and these surgeons do not, then it's this surgeon. So focus on that surgeon. Because you can have OR problems, and OR problems are things like um, in, in orthopedics. Um, I think I have a slide later. You have Orthopedic joints are done in a room that has a, the, the, the air has to be at least 20 time exchange. A lot of times the, the, the setup is different, like you have an OR here, an OR here, and you have a thing in the middle, and all the circulation happens. So you don't want circulation. Have you ever seen what the orthopedic people use when they're doing joints? They look like a space suit. Yeah. They, they have it as a space suit, the circulation is at least 20, or and then they have. The, everything happens in the middle and the rooms are on the side. They will, you have minimal amount of people in the room. I mean, there's a lot of things that are done physically. So if you have a hospital uh, that doesn't have the good OR, uh, the good security, I mean, the, 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 the air changes are wrong. The, there's too many, too many people going out of the OR. Those are, those are problems. But if everything is okay, 
it's just one surgeon doing, that's a surgical problem. And then, then you need to figure out whether it's, uh, you know, and most surgical issues have to do with too long of a surgery, not good um, 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 control of bleeding and some other techniques that, that may be in there. Uh, uh, but, 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 you know, but that's, that's how you can tell the, the difference. So, so the majority of the joints do fine and very few get infected. And we get a lot of infected joints from other places to fix them at Tampa General. It's not that they were our infections, but they're coming from somewhere else infected. Okay, so prosthetic joint infections after they happen, which should be rare, right? And it should not be happening. But if they happen, they're dividing type one, two, and three. And the type one is the ones that are within, the, within three months of surgery. The type two is up to two years. And both type one and type two are considered to be associated with surgery. Um, type three is greater than two years and it's usually hematogenous. It came from the blood, okay? So uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about this. So, they con so prosthetic joint infections can come from surgery and that's usually for type one and two or hematogenous for the type three. The first two years are usually surgical contamination and the, um, the type one is uh, can be uh, either superficial and maybe just a wound problem or maybe deep. And a lot of times when they go in there to debrief them and, and we're going to talk about it, the surgeon will let you know how deep it was and they take it, and they don't want to go down to the joint itself unless it's in, it looks infected because it may just be a lot of times it has to do with hematoma. So remember that the surgeons hate hematomas. Why? Right? I mean, think about what do you do? How do you culture in the lab, you culture with blood, right? So if you have a surgeon and right after joint, a lot of patients get anticoagulated. I mean, usually part of the post-op care is anticoagulation, correct? Because of DVT prophylaxis. So if you have, if you develop a hematoma post-op, it may be something very superficial. So they just want to clean that out. Uh, and that may not be deep into the joint. But, you know, but, uh, and, and a lot of, and the, the OR, if you read it, you'll see the superficial, we got the cultures here, we look deep. Um, in the post-op. Um, the type two is late chronic within that, those two years. And those usually are more associated with interleukin pathogens like the staphepis, the propionobacterium, that kind of thing, the diphtheroid, that kind of thing. The type three can be about anything because it's hematogen. A lot of times comes from a UTI, from staph oils, from something else. So early on said the type one, usually these are gonna be more viral in organisms. Um, you know, the patient went to the OR within the first uh, um, a few months, they come in draining from the knee, draining from the hip, draining from the, draining from whatever. Uh, and they're going to be, so it's going to be, you know, they can be mixed, they can be, uh, and a lot of times it was associated with uh, with hematomas. The, the type two are more indolent and it's usually coat negative enterococcus and propionobacterium is especially a problem in shoulder joints. Uh, and, and also, a lot of hospitals cannot even isolate uh, propionobacterium because, you know, um, there's a lot of reasons. Um, dealing with this kind of cultures is not easy. We're going to talk a little bit about that. So, and then the late onset of hematogens, and it can be, you know, staphorium, prep, enterobacteriaceae, whatever. Now, what are the risk factors for a uh, prosthetic joint? If you have had a prior prosthetic joint infection, of course, you're going to have most risk. And at Tampa General and in any respectable hospital, if you do a redo, you always, always check in the OR. And what do you do when you do a redo? What is the what is what do we do in the OR when you do a redo? Does anybody know? You do you're gonna you're gonna check you're gonna do cultures, but you're also gonna do a frozen section. Why do you do a frozen section? What is the what is what is the definition by frozen section of an infected joint? I told you this already in another lecture. You forgot. The disease. Thank you, God. Somebody remember. <laughs> so the so you're gonna do, you're gonna go to the OR and <laughs> the, the, uh, the 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 prosthetic joint is taken out the old one, even if the patient has no symptoms. And a lot of these patients, when they um, because if they have symptoms, they probably got already aspirated before they came to the hospital, and they, and they already kind of know. A lot of times they know for a, for a redo, 
they know that the patient may have had pain or may have had something. I know pain can be a mechanical issue, something maybe, but if you have a joint that looks like it's a little dislodged, any mechanical loosening in orthopedics is mechanical versus infection. You always have to check for infection, right? You have to do that. So mechanical loosening is a, or infection, right? So, so they're gonna, the, the, when the patient's gonna go to the OR and the patient is going, is going to have a frozen section. And if there's more than five white blood cells by high power field, that person is not going to get a new joint. That person is going to get debrided, get a spacer, and hormone IV antibiotics. Um, we're going to talk about uh, different stages of what we do and what is done in different countries and things like that in a minute. But if, if there's any suspicion of a prosthetic joint infection, actually before the patient goes, comes in, they're going to get aspirated before they come in, and they're going to be evaluated. But even if there's no suspicion, they're going to get a frozen section and five fibro cells per high power field. They're probably not going to get a joint. There are exceptions to that. Suppose that you have a 90-year-old that doing a two-step procedure is a nightmare, then you're going to put the joint in. I mean, there are some exceptions to that. But a normal person that has a prosthetic joint infection that have prior prosthetic joints that looks infected, it's not going to get a joint put in, okay? So um, the other big risk factors, concurrent infection or thermal surgery, they always, all of the patients that have, they're going to have orthopedic infection or orthopedic surgery, they get an MRSA screen of their nose before surgery. They're also going to get, make sure that they don't have any active infection. They all get a urinalysis, they all get blood work. You do not take an infected, any, any, um, that may be even the, the cases that you don't want any infection because you, know, you don't want to infect that, uh, that joint. And obviously comorbidities, you know, think about if you have a patient that has a psoriatic plaque over where you're going to do surgery or something like that, obviously all that, those patients are going to have higher uh, issues uh, and of MRSA colonization. So, what, so the risk factors may be the patient, it may be the procedure. Things that pre, all revisions have higher chance of getting infected because you don't have as good bone, things have happened there in the past, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the procedure may have been too long. Again, the number of OR personnel, like with <coughs> his question before, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, post-op bleeding of hematomas, and the, and the OR setup, I mean, the ventilation system, um, most, you do not do, um, in, they are always in any respectable surgical suites. They have a specific rooms for orthopedic that are, Usually not used for anything else, and they use and they have a lot of more ventilation, um, and that is uh, they, and the setup is a little different, like I explained to you before. So you can have the approach once you know that it's infected. It's, there's three approaches. Um, you can debride it and retain the device. You can do what is called a single stage or a two stage procedure. Um, in the U.S., usually we do a two stage, except very early on. When you have a, when that, 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 that type one, that within the first few months, most of the time, the prosthesis is not taken out. Uh, it's just the breeding and IV antibiotics are given because it's too fresh. So that is, um, you, know, you have a stable prosthesis, you have, uh, and the early onset usually do not, um, they do not take out the prosthesis. They just clean it out and you treat it. And if they have to take out the prosthesis, that will happen later. Um, in the single stage, um, you have it for for patients that have, um, you can do it because you have a very low viral organism because everything looks good. Also, a lot of times the single stage procedure is done because the patient cannot handle the two stage procedure. Actually, in Europe, the single stage procedure is done a lot, but there's a higher failure. In the U.S., the two stage is what is done as long as the patient can tolerate it because the chances of of, of success is a lot higher. Um, so, and the two stages, everything comes out, patient is treated, and then you're going to be off antibiotics and everything, and then you're going to aspirate, you're going to make sure all your numbers set, raise your piece, everything is back to normal, off antibiotic, then you go back to pre implantation. So, the current standard for chronic infection is a two stage removal of the prosthesis with the remit. Mm -hmm. Placement of an antibiotic impregnated cement spacer. The spacer 
is commonly put as a to say, you know, again in orthopedic, you always they always they're, they're very fixated in keeping spaces, keeping the muscles, keeping everything, and that's what it helps. With. And then uh, and then they do the second uh, procedure. So the two ex two stage usually in between there you have the spacer and the spacer usually have antibiotics. Um, uh, and the uh, and the spacer has antibiotic. Um, th the same thing that you use for the beads, that same material is what is used for the spacer. And they have local delivery of the antibiotics. And a lot of times patients with the spacers, you know, they preserve the mo mo mobility because there's, you know, and so that you can maintain all of the muscles around uh, the joint. Because remember, there's nothing better for a joint than the mus the muscles protect the joint. What is the best thing that you can have to protect your knee to have good? Uh, what is the best thing to protect the neck? Of the football players to have huge neck, right? So muscles protect the <laughs> muscles protecting the bones. So if you are, just think about it, football players with huge necks, well, we need huge huge muscles around the knees and the hips and things like that to protect them. So we so if we can preserve patient mobility, that's going to be good, and that's what the, the spacers do. Um, and actually, it, the, in the two step procedures, um, two stages, uh, I mean for hips and for knees, you can see that they are very high. Uh, cure rate and successful as long as everything is done correctly. So, uh, so, so that you understand the terminology, one stage everybody knows what it is now. Two stage everybody knows what it is. What is a um, um, a resection arthroplasty? What do you think <clears throat> when they tell you, "Oh, this patient is going to get a resection arthroplasty"? Can you tell me what that is? Does anybody know? That is the bad news. <laughs> when they tell you recession or arthroplasty, that means that things are so bad that everything is coming out and nothing is going back in. So you're going to have to let bone bone fuse. And that's very rarely done, but it is done sometimes, like I said, especially like you have an atypical mycobacterial infection on patients that are very immunocompromised. You know, like um, I follow for many years a young woman with bad lupus and a combined immunodeficiency that had a um, um, mycobacterium avium, intercellulary, prosthetic joint, and we had no choice. Eventually, we just did a resection arthroplasty and let it let it be. But that's, you know, the, the leg is shorter. It's very difficult. But actually, you know, she graduated from high school and, and she um, and she worked as, as an optician in a thing. And and actually, I took care of her for 20 some years uh, and, and became part of, kind of part of the family because it breaks your heart, somebody like that. I mean, it was a young, young girl, with really bad immune system. And we did everything possible, but she had an MAI infection of the joint, and there was no choice but to do a resection arthroplasty, uh, and her infection was in the hip. So that means that there's nothing there. And usually that that's uh, done a lot for hips, because in the knees, a lot of times they do what is called an arthrodesis. What it is is that they fuse it with an external fixator, if you cannot have it. But now you're going to have it, a straight leg. Um, you may have seen those in some of the uh, uh, hemophilia patients. Hemophiliac patients, because of having pre, um, recurrent um, problems with um, with bleeding, they have fused uh, legs. And um, and actually, I know there's in for those patients. Uh, actually, there's an orthopedic in, uh, gains or that uh, have been having really success. I, I got one patient that I sent up there, and he's doing great. Um, I mean, after being fused for years, um, he's having movement. Which you can't believe how difficult it is to live with a straight leg, try getting in and out of a car, going to the bathroom. I mean, it is very hard. So I just want to make sure that you understand the terminology because, you know, it's very important that if you're going to do this, you understand the terminology. So we need to understand what one step exchange is, what two step exchange is, what the resection arthroplasty is, which is a disaster, right? We don't want that. And the arthrodesis means that they're going to fuse it. Uh, and the, uh, the resection arthroplasty is commonly when you can't fix a hip. Uh, the arthrodesis um, is usually when you cannot fix a knee. Um, and obviously, amputation is the last thing, which occasionally does happen. Um, so, uh, I just want to review the bone protocol for everybody. Now, the bone protocol, uh, it, was it was designed specifically for joint infections. But now we use it for everything else, right? We use it for trauma, we use it for everything. But it was designed specifically, actually, under, under Dr. Senna's go and get this done. Uh, Dr. Frankel, the shoulder guy, and me did it when we were fellows on the Dr. Senna's guidance. Uh, so um, you always have to do, you have to collect minimum of three samples, always five to seven. 
And the reason for that is that you can see that the more samples you have, the higher yield it is. So nobody's going to collect less than three samples, but uh, and, I'll, and I'll allow them to collect a lot more. Uh, you want to have the patient uh, of antimicrobials for two weeks. That's what we have decided, even though ideally it's longer. Uh, now, one of the big things that you have to realize that if you cannot get this bone to the lab within two hours, that's a problem. And if you cannot, like for example, I have this problem in one of my outside hospitals, we put it in a thio, so that in a fringe thio, so that it can be transported. Because if you don't do something with it, you're not going to grow anything. Um, obviously, sonification um, sonification um, means that and we do sonify the, I mean, it got vibrated, it's a vibration so that the bacteria gets, um, uh, gets released. And actually, it has to be incubated for uh, uh, for a while. Um, this is a big issue. We do it here, and we have been able to implement it in some hospitals. Some hospitals we cannot. In a lot of hospitals, when you have a joint infection, all they do is they, they get some swabs. The chances of you getting anything there is horrible, and it is a shame when the patients that have an, infect, an infected joint go to those hospitals, which you're never going to know what it's going to grow. And um, you know. You have the frozen section, which we have talked about how important that is in the OR, right? Because that tells you whether you can reimplant or not. And the surgeons do use that uh, for reimplantation. Then you'll see people come out without that. Permanent pathology, but either one uh, greater than five white blood cells per high power field is the definition of acute osteo. Um, And then we do aerobic, anaerobic, fungal, and AFD, smears, and cultures. Um, and this is how it's set up at the five pieces of bone. Uh, one piece goes into formalin to go to pad, four pieces in a set of cup for everything else, and that's, just, that's the one that gets the sonification and the anaerobic protocol for anaerobic cultures. And this is how it's done, but I, I, you, can, you, you can look at that. I, I have given you this to you and all the abbreviations a few times. Um, and what it does, it allows like the same, um, the same language for everybody, and, uh, and it's important for the OR, the we have all agreed as a team uh, in conjunction with, with ortho how to deal with this. And uh, and also the frozen sections are really important for them to decide whether to pre-implant or not. And so that you understand how we do this bone culture um, interpretation, if both the histopathology and the plate, obviously, that's is a no-brainer. If the pathology is positive, there's nothing more certain the pathology. You're going to treat, right? whether the culture is positive or not. Um, if the broth, um, um, if, the if the plate is, is positive, but the broth is not, that's a contaminated in the, in the lab because the broth has, can develop it, a, a, right? A, um, you're not gonna have something in a plate and not be in the broth. That, that makes sense, right? Because the broth should handle a lower inoculum than the plate. So that's, so the, the problem is hard when you start having like, uh, broth positive and path is negative, those are very hard. And usually we treat for two weeks. But we always take in consideration the history of the patient. If you have a patient that have had over and over and over infection and the bacteria is the same that we had had before, then you're going to treat. So you have to use, you know, at the end of the day, we don't take care of pathology cultures. We take care of patients. So you always have to have the history of what's happening to the patient in mind when you're doing any of these things. Uh, and we have to understand that, you know, we're going to dip six weeks. A lot of times we go into pills afterwards. We do labs, I mean, weekly. And remember that, you know, I cannot emphasize how hard it is. After three weeks of IV antibiotics, patients start having low white counts, pig line problems, all kinds of problems. Um, and we a lot of times give all antibiotics later. Um, and sometimes when you have no choice and you're retaining because you did a one stage procedure or there's an infection or there's a problem, some of those patients get stuck on long-term antibiotics. And I think that some of you, hopefully that you have been on the seventh floor, uh, have seen um, uh, have seen that. Um, so we have talked about hematogenous osteo, some of the other contiguous osteo of different kinds, um, and prosthetic joints. We didn't talk much about secular decubitus and things like that, because I know that you get a lot of that at the VA. Hopefully, um, you know, uh, and the importance of flaps and not over-treating patients in, in, on that setting. Uh, do you have any questions about any of this? Uh, 